I'd like to welcome everyone to First Christian Church of Ashland. We thank you for coming out on such a glorious, beautiful day as this that God has provided for us. And we thank you for tuning in on our Facebook page, too. We hope you feel God's presence today and forever. And I would like to extend a, a truly a, a blessed thank you for coming out for the, uh, the Shelby Choir, that they're going to regale us with some beautiful music very shortly. So, and all of you that have come out to listen to them and, and others that have come in, uh, even the first time, you are all welcome here in our church. So would you all join me in our call to worship? We gladly join with fellow Christians everywhere the spiritual kinship that we feel with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. There is one body and there is one spirit. Help us to acknowledge you, O God, and put our trust in you. We are called to be a spiritual community in the midst of the world. So on this Sunday of World Communion, we pray for all the members of your universal church that we are bound together by spiritual ties and labor together for the coming of your reign. Would you join me in our invocation? We praise you, O holy God, the very source of life, as we join our voices together and connect through communion with our brethren around the world. May we be faithful to your calling and the sharing of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to stand, please do, and let's uh, sing together our opening hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Yeah. 
seated. Good morning. Good morning. Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 26. And you can follow along on page 503 in your pew Bible. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mine, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. Those in whose hands are evil devices and those whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. few prayer requests to share with you this morning. Uh, first, from Sandy Carpenter, she asked that we lift uh, Chris Carpenter up in our prayers. Uh, Mary Lee has shared with us that uh, Mike Reynolds is having kidney stone problems right now and is in much pain. Uh, from Marcia Galloway, um, wants to let share with everybody that Marjorie Whitman fell and broke her hip. And Tammy Scott is having hernery, hernia, excuse me, hernia surgery tomorrow. And um, Miriam Brady on October 10th is having a procedure for AFib. So we're going to lift all those folks in prayer this morning. And if you would please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together as a community of believers. We pray for unity and fellowship among us. Help us to love one another as you have loved us and to support and encourage each other in our walk with you. Remove any divisions or strife that may hinder our unity and fill us with your peace and harmony. May our fellowship be a reflection of your love and grace and may we grow stronger together in our faith. We come before you today seeking your guidance and wisdom. As we gather here, we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us in truth and understanding open our hearts and minds to your word, and help us to discern your will in every decision we make. Grant us the wisdom to navigate the challenges we face and the courage to follow your path. May your light shine upon us, illuminating our way, and may we always seek to glorify you in all we do. And gracious God, we lift those up who are in need of healing and comfort today. We lift to you, Father Mary and Brady, Marjorie Whitman, Tammy Scott, Mike Reynolds, and Chris Carpenter. Lord, you are the great physician, and we trust in your power to heal and restore. We pray for those who are sick, injured, or suffering in any way. Bring them to your healing touch and grant them strength and peace. Comfort those who are grieving or in pain and surround them with your love and presence. 
and may they find solace in your promises and hope in your unfailing love. We come before you seeking your peace and calm in our lives in a world filled with chaos and uncertainty. We need your tranquility. Quiet our anxious hearts and minds and fill us with your perfect peace and help us cast our cares upon you and trust in your sovereign control. Heavenly Father, we ask for your joy and your hope to fill our hearts. In the midst of trials and challenges, help us find joy in you. Remind us of the hope we have in Christ and the promises of your word. May your joy be our strength and our hope, and your hope our anchor. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us radiate your joy and hope to those around us. In Jesus' name, let us sing the Lord's Prayer together. Thank you, Matt. Everybody said, gee, Rich, you're not going to have to have a message today because of all the music. And I fooled everybody. I'm going to message. <laughs> It'll be short, but one of the things I, um, especially in during communion, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, who really is this Jesus person, right? Have you really asked yourself that? This man who calls himself the Son of God? <laughs> who is he who we remember each time that we come to our table for communion? In fact, today, it is estimated that close to 2 billion people will celebrate communion around the world all together. What an outstanding moment that is. It's too bad we can't do that every day, to be together and do for God. In the Old Testament, prophecies point toward who this person of Jesus is. And then the four Gospels, if you will, the first four uh, books in the uh, New Testament, they follow his life, and they give us his teachings, and they give us his wisdom. Pretty good stuff. So again, I ask each and every one of you, who is this Jesus? Well, the author of the book of Hebrews, which is close to the end of the uh, New Testament, I think spells out who Jesus is incredibly well in the first chapter, in the first four verses. And, uh, and that's what I would like to read to you here in a moment or two. And... Um, so you can contemplate on these words for a moment. In fact, the book of Hebrews, um, nobody knows who wrote it, which I think is interesting. A lot of people say that it was Paul, but when Paul wrote his letters, he always signed them. And the verbiage in the Hebrews isn't quite the way Paul spoke and wrote. But so some people really think that it was um, one of his followers, uh, like Silas or someone else in the case, or it could have actually been Luke writing something toward the end of his life too. But here are these words from the book of Hebrews. And it's on um, one of the pages of your pew Bible. <laughs> I don't have that written down, sorry. But if you'd like to follow along. It says, um, God 
after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the, of the prophets in many portions and in many ways, and these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than even they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. May God add his beautiful blessings on those to me fabulous words. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not, but the very first verse that I just read, it says that um, all that was spoken by the prophets is now revealed through God's Son. That's what that first verse said. It's a new time now, a new age, and it was begun through Jesus, the Christ, who is going to bring us judgment but also salvation. Now, the main revelation is this, though. Jesus is God made human, made visible for each of us because he came to us on earth. The author then gives us four words and phrases to show and explain his authority over the whole world. And that's what these first uh, four verses tell us. One, he said he is the heir of all things. Two, he is the very image of God. Three, he will, be, he will uphold, in other words, he will govern all things. And the fourth thing is he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. What I'd like to do is just briefly pick on each one of those just so we totally understand exactly who this Jesus is. So the first is Jesus is the heir of all things. Now an heir very simply, and many of us know this, when if we made out our last wills and testaments and we leave everything to our family members, an heir is the person with the legal right of an inheritance. We're being told that God appointed Jesus, his son, and he is now the heir of the whole creation, which is the world. In fact, even the universe. Jesus is all about unity. It's one voice for everything, one absolute truth for everyone, and he gives us knowledge through his word. Nothing or no one has ever impacted the world as quickly and actually as completely as Jesus did when he first appeared. Think about the world changed with this one person on earth. The heir is God's promise to us. He is our redeemer. He's our savior, and he is uh, the one true way to our father back to heaven. Now, the second thing is made in the image of now, I like this one because uh, I'm going to mispronounce it. It's a Greek word, and uh, Greek is uh, pretty Greek, I'll tell you. But um, the Greek word that they used in the original writings that they found in the book of, uh, of Hebrew was in Greek, and the word is karakakater. You know, a nice word, huh? But doesn't it sound familiar? Character? Yeah, that's where we get our word character. Now, the Greeks used this word to create an exact replica of the original. That's how the word is made and used, the exact replica, not something close. In verse 3, it's used to describe the son whose character is an exact replica of the father. Hmm. Jesus said, if you have seen me, then you have seen the father. You see? Character, exact replica. God is revealed in Jesus, and he's revealed completely, totally. And because we are made in God's image, that is, we are people, Jesus came also to be with us as a human, holy man, with a W, holy, but also he is holy God, with a W, completely, complete. Now the third thing is he upholds all things by the power of his word. To uphold means to direct or to govern. Now, the power of his word is God's creative power. If you recall in the very first book of the Old Testament, what did he do? 
He used his word and he said, let there be light, let there be an expanse, let there be sky, land, water, animals, humans, that's us. And then in the book of John, I love the book of John, the way it begins, because it says, in the beginning, the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. See, even John is telling us Jesus is God right there in that reflection. It means Jesus is the holder of the power. He is the power. And he also provides purification for our sins. Those were the words that I read. Now, what was interesting is this book was written because many Jewish people were starting to say, maybe we should go back to what we were believing earlier. And one of the things was sacrificial forgiveness. I mean, the way the old system was, you had to offer to God something if you did something bad or if you wanted to praise him. You brought him grain, you brought him bread, you brought him an animal, and the priest took care of that for you. But when Jesus came and when he died on the cross for us, he gave his body, he gave his life one sacrifice, and it eliminates all other sacrifice that was ever needed in the world. We now have him to thank for that. His sacrifice was done for all, and that was on the cross for all time. Now, he gave himself also willingly to purify our soul and to forgive us of our sins. And all of this is accomplished by his word and by his deed. So even today, though, many still cannot in the world or will not even accept this wonderful gift that was given by the Son of God. I pray that everyone in this room understands that or else will understand that and give yourself to him. Now, the fourth thing that the author brought up was sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. Once Jesus' mission on earth was completed, and that was his death and resurrection, and his forgiveness of our sins, he ascended to the heavenly kingdom from where he came, if we need to put that in there, and he took his rightful seat at the right hand of the Father. And I think it's interesting in the fourth verse is where it states that he inherits a superior name. And what, and 2,000 years ago, the name was actually a very important part of someone's life. It reflected the person's character, and it also reflected his identity and where he came from. Even today, though, we often speak of a person's name as part of their character, power, and even reputation. So what is Jesus' name? Jesus. It's a revelation of God. And his name actually means he who saves. That's what Jesus means, that word. And it's a name that's uh, stating that he is the ultimate high priest of the world. And he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I would be amiss if I would say that this choir will be singing king on kings and lord of lords from Handel's by around Christmas time. <laughs> Hint, hint. No. <laughs> but that's quite a lot for just four little verses, isn't it? Everything that I got out of that. But when we look upon Jesus, we see God. We need to understand that. And we see who God is and who and what God cares about. And guess what? God cares about everyone on the face of the earth. All of us. And Jesus came into the world that we might all know God. That was why he came. So on this World Communion Sunday, let us gather around this table where we're going to be fed and we're going to be nourished by our host, Jesus Christ, the one who gave his body and gave his blood for you and I. And then following once our, we have this wonderful feast, we are to go out into the world. We're to bring our reflected images, our character, which comes to us through Christ, and we're to take that out to a lost and a hurting, hurting world so that other people might see us and in us would also see Jesus. Amen. So let us now come to this table of life, our communion table is usually down here and I point to it, but it's way up there. But um, 
a little instruction of how we take communion. The tray will come, and there will be two cups, uh, a small cup with a cracker in it and another cup in the middle it, with the juice in it. Just take the two cups and hold on to them, and then we will take them all together uh, with the words of institution. And the last thing I will say is everyone is welcome at this table. If you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter whether you're a member here, a member there, or a member nowhere except believe in Jesus, you are welcome at this table. So what I'd like to do is let us prepare our hearts by just taking a moment and contemplating who we are, who Jesus is, and then we will begin. And all God's people said, amen. Let's join our voices together in our communion hymn, One Bread and One Body.
For I received from the Lord what I now also hand on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took a simple loaf of bread. When he had given thanks to it with his Father in heaven, he broke it, and with it he said, This is my body that is for you, so do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way after supper, he took a cup and he said, this cup is now the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul added these beautiful words to this moment when he said, for as often as you eat of this bread and that you drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until that glorious moment when he returns. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of offering and dedication. God of faithfulness, in every age you call men and women to make it known your love. May we who celebrate this holy meal today be strengthened in the ministries to which we are called and go boldly to witness in your holy name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Testing. There we are. Okay, as the children get ready, uh, first we we'll say thank you very much. Uh, this is the members of the Shelby Chamber Choir, and we're going to do a couple selections. Uh, they are directed by myself and Joe Dubert right there, and Joe is in uh, is first year with us. And this is our second performance uh, in terms of singing in front of, <laughs> of people. Uh, we sang in front of a, a senior breakfast uh, back on Wednesday. So uh, as we say to them lovingly, I don't know what to expect. And so, uh, but we're just glad to be here and to share our music with you. So th our first piece will be uh, Shut the Dough. Uh, followed by a piece called Keep Your Lamps Trimmed and Burning. Soloist, uh, I, I jokingly said this is a weird year of solos because it's the Bra Brothers. Uh, you'll see a Braden, a Brandon, and a Brevin. I don't know, um, I, it just happened to be that way. And then of course later Gavin and um, a little guy, Alex, uh, on occasion. So uh, this is Shut the Dough, and could someone hand this to Branson please? Shut 
Shut the door. Keep out the devil. You gotta shut the door. Keep the devil in Whoa, shut the door. Keep out the devil. Children.
Our next selection will be uh, solo, and the other ones will be standing there backing him on. This is Gavin as he sings uh, the Dorsey arrangement of There Will Be Peace in the Valley. <laughs> I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls, calls me away, oh yes, well the morning is bright and the If anybody asks you where I'm going, where I'm going soon. So if you want to know
sinners that he has brought me out. He is my God and I'll serve him. I know God is able to deliver in time of storm, and I know that'll keep you safe from all earthly harm. One day when my soul is at rest, I'm going home to be forever blessed. My God deliver Moses from King Pharaoh and didn't he cool the fiery furnace for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when I think of what my God can do he delivered Daniel and I know that he'll deliver you Trust and never doubt, Jesus will surely bring you out. He never failed me yet. You have blessed us like you just can't believe. Thank you for coming out so much. And uh, we'll have a meal for you uh, in just a little bit. We'll have it prepared for you. So uh, 
This is a great day to worship, is it not? So. So uh, as we leave this place and we go out into the world, um, there's a lot of people that need to hear our youth singing about God and loving it and loving him. What a wonderful thing. But we need to go out and, as we talked about this character, we need to go out and reflect, reflect our God to this world that needs us so much. So as we go, may God take your hands, may he work through them. May he take your lips and speak through them. May he take your minds and think through them. And may he take your hearts and set them on fire with love. So through the power of Christ who goes with you, I bid you all good day. God go with you. Amen. Thank you.